Hi, I'm Tim Smith. I'm the project coordinator for the Western Republican River Riparian Improvement Project. Today I'm speaking to you from the historic Hayward Ranch in southwest Nebraska. It's a very cold January day. I'd like to take a few minutes and just explain to you why invasive species have become such a problem in the Republican River Valley in western Nebraska. Currently, in the Republican River Valley, we're battling four species. And those four are Russian olive, eastern red cedar, salt cedar, and phragmites. Now let's take a minute and discuss each one of those in a little more detail. Now this is Russian olive. Russian olive is native to Europe and western Asia. It was introduced into the United States in the late 1800s and was widely planted for shelter belts and landscaping. Its leaves are long and narrow and they're a dull green with a silvery sheen. In the summer it produces a small white or yellow flower and then these develop into a fruit that's small and white and looks like a berry. The bark is a silvery gray and it has a shredded appearance and on the younger branches you'll often find very large sharp thorns. We have seen these in the Republican Valley up to 30 feet tall, but they do get larger. Few animals feed or bother Russian olives, so there really is no biologic control. And as with all four of our invasive species, Russian olive has the ability to form dense monoculture thickets that completely choke out any of our native plants. This is Phragmites. Phragmites is just the common European reed. It's native to Eurasia and Africa and was introduced into the United States in the late 1800s. It can grow to 15 feet in height and it forms dense impenetrable reed beds. It has broad pointed leaves and these arise from thick vertical stalks. The flower heads are thick and fluffy and they're gray to purple in color. Again, it's usually found in dense thickets growing in or near shallow water and these thickets displace native plants and animals. They also drastically alter the hydrology of a stream and they block the sunlight to the aquatic community. Phragmites grows incredibly quickly and before you know it, it can completely choke a stream or river. Now let's focus a little bit on salt cedar. Salt cedar is native to North Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East. It was introduced into the United States in the middle 1800s for use as an ornamental and for erosion control. It's distinguished by its feathery needle-like leaves and small pink to purple flowers at the end of its branches. It has silvery bark and the young stems are reddish brown and it forms into a many-stemmed upright bush. One plant can produce up to one half million wind-blown seeds. The leaves, seeds, and twigs are extremely low in nutrients, and as a result, very few insects or wildlife will use them. It is very difficult to control salt cedar because it re-sprouts readily after cutting or burning. What you see behind me is a very large salt cedar tree. Now, you may be asking yourselves, why am I showing you a salt cedar tree in the middle of winter? In the middle of winter is the best time to show you a little trick that salt cedars have up their sleeves. Come here, I want to show you what they do. Now I'm right underneath that big salt cedar tree. What you're looking at under here is about an inch of leaf litter that has fallen off of this tree the previous fall. Now salt cedars are deep groundwater feeders. They have the ability to tap deep into groundwater and pull the accompanying salts and everything up with that groundwater. What happens is those salts get concentrated in the foliage of this tree. When these leaves drop in the fall, all that salt goes right on the ground, right underneath this tree. That effectively hypersalinates all this soil right around this tree. And that in turn keeps any native species from recolonizing this area. This tree has effectively eliminated any competition right around it. It's actually quite brilliant. It's a uh, very simple form of chemical warfare. Now let's focus on eastern red cedar. Eastern red cedar isn't a cedar at all. It's actually a species of juniper. It's the most common conifer in the eastern half of the United States. In southwest Nebraska, eastern red cedar can reach heights of 40 feet. It has both a male and a female tree, and the female is readily distinguishable by the presence of blueberries. 
It was and still is widely planted for shelter belts and ornamental uses, and it is rapidly spread by birds throughout its range. Eastern red cedar is easily controlled by periodic fires, as it is highly susceptible to fire damage, and this was once the primary limiting factor on red cedar populations. Eastern red cedar wasn't much of a problem in Nebraska until the advent of modern fire suppression. Without the controlling influence of fire, eastern red cedar thrives and it will eventually dominate prairie and forest vegetation. A question that I've been asked is why are eastern red cedars considered an invasive species? And although it's true that eastern red cedars are native to Nebraska, they're not native in anywhere near these numbers or concentrations along the river corridors. As with our other three invasives, eastern red cedar has the ability to form dense thickets that completely choke out any desirable vegetation. And now we know that one of the biggest problems with invasive species is they completely choke out everything else. And this spot is a perfect example. In this one spot, I've got a salt cedar, a red cedar, and a Russian olive. Those three invaders are growing within about a 10 foot circle. I'm pretty sure they have everything else choked out. If you ever wanted a good reason to remove invasive species from your river bottom, that right there is as good as it gets. What you're looking at there is a pretty solid thicket of uh, Russian olive, red cedar. There's actually a few salt cedars growing in there also. But every one of those cottonwoods is either dead or dying. The reason those cottonwoods are dead or dying is we've gone through an extended period of drought and low river flows in southwest Nebraska. That in itself probably wouldn't be enough to kill all of those trees. But those invaders that are growing right underneath them, robbing those resources from those larger trees, that can do it. There's a pretty simple explanation as to why all of those red cedars and Russian olives are concentrated right under those cottonwoods. Red cedars and Russian olives produce a berry and those berries are eaten by birds. The birds then land up in those big cottonwoods and they deposit those seeds right underneath them. Well over a period of years, you can get a tremendous population of those two invaders growing right under your cottonwood canopy. And again over a period of years, those two species can really weaken those adult cottonwoods. And they can contribute to the death of those cottonwoods. And that's something that we're seeing in this spot as well as up and down the entire Republican River Valley. Now there are a lot of good reasons to remove those invasive species from the Republican River in southwest Nebraska, but in the end, this is probably the best reason right here. The Republican River has sustained and nourished man and beast in southwest Nebraska for thousands of years, and it continues to do so to this day. The fate of southwest Nebraska is inextricably entwined with the fate of the Republican River. Not only is it in our best interest to ensure the continued health and vitality of the Republican River, it's the right thing to do. backup singers. <laughs>